teacher, activist in uh, revitalizing the Wyandotte language and culture. Today, we are learning from his experience in working with archaeologists in determining the technique and processes of traditional pottery ways. If you enjoy what you see today, I guarantee you, you can look forward to uh, Mona working with Richard Moore in the future as they are developing uh, a series of ancestral pottery building. Oh my gosh, I that is that sounds so exciting. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn the, the show over here uh, to Richard. Richard, thanks for joining us today. Oh. Uh, my, uh, my Wyandotte name is Sohahio, uh, given to me in the Longhouse in Quebec, um, and, and I'm of the Bear Clan, and I just said I'm real happy to be here and to be able to share uh, with everybody today. This is kind of a big passion of mine. Um, and there's so much to talk about. I'm just going to have to jump right in and start showing you things uh, and get right into it. So um, I'm just going to say, uh, you know, that um, back in 1979, 1979, um, I was working at a little school just off the Navajo Reservation as an art teacher. And um, they gave us $50 for the year for uh, art supply. So we had to do a lot of scrounging. And <laughs> one of the things we found was out in the desert, there's plenty of clay. And I'd been working with clay. Uh, I'd gone to school several years and kind of uh, majoring in clay. I never got a degree or anything because I I, didn't, I ran out of money. So anyway, uh, but uh, we brought clay back and we started making a lot of pottery. So one of the things I noticed out there in the desert when we were out there, just everywhere were these little sherds like this. You know, you'll see these are the what they call the corrugated pottery sherds. I hope everybody can see that okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of different, there were different techniques. But, you know, when I was seeing these things, um, I'd never seen this kind of pottery before. I, I grew up in the Midwest here, you know, I mean... You don't just have things like this laying on the surface of the ground that are 900 years old. Uh, everything's covered here. So my, um, I was just really interested in trying to figure out you know, how this stuff was done. So uh, once I got that one piece I showed you, like a rim shirt like this, where I could actually see where the rim is, mm -hmm. then I could actually say, oh, okay, I see what's going on here. And I started studying it. And I noticed that it was all in shingle lapped the coils are all put on in shingle laps and they're tiny coils. So uh, I started uh, working on reproductions first. This is what I was doing. Uh, and I'm gonna show you, this is kind of the way uh, one of these pots start typically in kind of a spiral, just like a basket. Mm -hmm. um, and it's uh, it started, you know, with just right in the middle and then it just uh, flattened over over itself and, and, you know, going on. So there's nothing, there's no form over the, uh, that you're building over. It's just the coils itself. And then once you get it, um, you know, to this size then it's flipped over um, and then it's built up the rest of the way. And of course, just like basketry, you know, you can, designs can be um, put in with your fingernails as you go. And this is just a little, little test sample that's been laying around. It's gotten broken. I probably dropped it off the shelf or something. Um, and then we'll find pieces that are that come out of a bigger. Uh, this is this is one of mine. Uh, this is actually a pot I use in the sweat lodge. Um, we use for water, and it holds five gallons of water. And the same thing. It started with a, a very small um, coiled uh, beginning there. And, and all the little um, prints you see are fingernail prints, finger, fingerprints and fingernail prints. And then this particular one, I noticed on some old shirts, they, they took it and they rubbed the surface after they built the pot, they kind of rubbed it down and that kind of got everything connected to itself. So, you know, I, I'm, I'm really fussy about detail and, and I just, I love the idea of um, getting grounded in, uh, traditional roots. So while I was doing this, I was also exploring, oh, we were living up in the Navajo area, 
And, you know, I was learning uh, a little bit of Navajo uh, language and I kept thinking, man, I should be learning my own language, you know? So I started writing back for uh, word lists and whatever I could find and, and um, started, you know, uh, I, I met somebody who could actually share some old recordings of the language. And to me, it was just an awakening, you know, cause I'd never heard that when I was growing up, you know, we just, I'd never heard the language being so uh, spoken. I'd never heard it being sung before. And so uh, things really began to wake up inside me. And I started thinking, I need to start exploring my own ancestry. And, you know, I knew we came from Ohio, but that's as far, you know, as a kid, that's all I knew, you know, is that the Wyandots were forced out of Ohio. But I didn't know about Ontario, the homelands, you know, Mandaga Yenge, you know, the old country. So, uh, so anyway, uh, I started, you know, again, researching that a little bit and, and um, looking into some of the pottery styles of our ancestors, of my ancestors, um, and and uh, beginning to to imitate and and this is the imitation idea is is really just to get grounded. Um, to me, this is not necessarily the artwork. This is this is just so that you can touch base with your ancestors where your ancestors left off, and you know so. Um, this has been something when I've done classes here too, um, uh, you know, I try to find out who the person is that, you know, what's their ancestry, where do they, you know, what, if they're indigenous to this continent, then, you know, let's look into that pottery, that, that tradition that their, um, their ancestors uh, laid the groundwork for, you know, and, mm -hmm. and help them get established there. I always feel like an artist is stronger if they're grounded in their own traditional arts first, you know, um, because I, I wish I had, you know, had been. So anyway, it's led me to all kinds of uh, things. And I've got, uh, I've brought a lot of sherds to show. Um, one of the things, let's go, going back to the old corrugated uh, method is, uh, if, I don't know if you can tell or see on this one, mm -hmm. you can see the fingerprints. Mm -hmm. These are 900 year old fingerprints in this, wow. in this little sherd right here. And these are things that, you know, as clay artists, they really move you because it's like you're you're reading it. You know, you're reading what's going on when something's being uh, when this clay was malleable when it was still soft. Here's another one which is pretty outstanding. It's pretty amazing. It's um, you can see the thumbprint and the the thumbnail in there. So, um, th you know, these were these were signs, too, to me. You know, it's like I wanted to to learn this method. Yes. But I also wanted to start learning about my own ancestors, too. Um, as far as my artwork, you know, my own artwork, I mean, I'm not even bringing that in on this program today. This is this is all about the ancestral stuff. Anybody yeah. want to look online? Richard Zane Smith, you can you'll find more than you ever wanted to see. Uh <laughs> But um, I did want to bring things because I've been working with some of the tribes in this area too, um, and we're we're looking into some of the traditions um, that come back from the homelands of different nations here. Um, I've also some friends have also um, sent me sherds. You know, from there's a friend of mine who works at the um, at a museum there in um, Pittsburgh. And he sent me some sherds that he found that had washed up on Lake Erie. And they're from a woodland culture. And the, the woodland culture, uh, you know, it's it overlaps so many years, you know, I mean, really hundreds and hundreds of years, uh, whether it's, you know, uh, early woodland or late, mm -hmm. or, you know. Uh, so, but so some of these little designs here, here's, a, here's an example of one that I, I was really fascinated with. I hope you wow. can see it okay. Mm -hmm. If you notice on the top, you see those little lines there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I realized that this was all done with the same tool on both sides. So I, uh, the only way I knew was to replicate it. So I, um, and this is what I came up with, basically. This is just a shirt, one of my own right here. And, mm -hmm. um, and the top. You know the same, and to get that, I tried a variety of tools first. And I ended up with uh, it's just this little bone tool. 
Um, and often archaeologists will find these little tools <laughs> like this, and they often call it a hairpin or something. And it's got little serrated teeth on the end. And so that is used. Mm -hmm. The reason I could tell that that sherd was done that way was that there's an unevenness between the teeth, you know, and that unevenness shows that there was a little space, you know, between the tool and that same tool had been used over and over there. And then I noticed it appearing the same unevenness, uh, you know, appearing close up mm -hmm. in there. So, mm -hmm. so these are kind of fascinating to me. And, um, being able to try to, to replicate, you know, to replicate the same, this very same pattern. And once, once, you know, you get into it like that, there's no turning back, you know, uh, some of the, uh, there, here's another one that, uh, that came up, washed up on the Lake Erie beaches. Mm -hmm. if, if you notice the rim has just worked like crazy. It's been right. It, wow. it's like they cannot leave the rim alone even the inside of the pot you know has been decorated too so mm. it's even got, even got a and those little um, when you look in there really deep what you find are teeth prints like this and mm -hmm. my theory on so many of these things is um, tools were we're not just one use tools. Tools are used for many different purposes. So somebody of this culture, very possibly making a pot, is sitting there and um, you know they just pick up a, a little fleshing tool. And this could have been a tool, a bone tool like this could have been used for tanning um, or scraping the, the, the uh, meat off of small hides. Because uh, I don't know if you worked hides before, some of you maybe have, but when you're pulling that that fat off uh, a, a toothed um, bone like this really grabs at the flesh and helps tear it away from the um, uh, from the the hide itself. So anyway, um, th this is some of my theory: is that uh, these are multi-purpose tools often, mm -hmm. that um, and then we start looking into. We're going to be overlapping and kind of jumping all over the place here, but. <clears throat> Um, so that, that, okay, this is one of the pieces that I made, um, looking at some of the sherds that were washed up on the beaches of, of, uh, Lake Erie. And we've seen pots like this are usually round bottom or almost pointy at times and mm -hmm. fairly, fairly light, not always light, but they're often light and you'll find these little indentations. You see oh yeah. Uh -huh. through there. Yeah. So some of those can be done with that same kind of tool I use there, uh, the the fleshing tool, or even the hairpin with the little um, pieces on it. And some of it can be done even with um, with almost like a little bow with a with a cord wrapped on it, and that cord is just laid on and just rolled like that. Just wow. Just rolled onto the pot. Yeah. And you can see those designs put in there. And uh, and so, of course, the cord marking, you know, really becomes a big thing. You see on a lot of older pots, um, especially in, uh, out this way, you know, not, uh, and in the Northeast. Uh, not so much in the Southwest. But uh, so we were looking at Fort Ancient pottery, some of the Fort Ancient stuff from middle Ohio and northern Kentucky. And okay, let's see. I don't have any shirts. Maybe I can share a shirt or two, a picture of them. Okay. Uh, just to give you an idea. Um, let's see. Size shirt early one. It's been great working with archaeologists, though, on these things because archaeologists have at their disposal, you know, all the shirts and things that we. Uh, don't always have and so it's really really wonderful you know to be able to um, to touch base with them because a lot of them are not necessarily potters you know so they don't, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They don't understand necessarily uh, how things were done now I'm gonna let's see if I can oh share, is it a screen share is that what I hit for that or no if I want to put in a picture yeah, Evan, can he, does he have permission to share his screen? 
or do I use the the um let's see what this does. Oh okay. Here we go. Okay, so let's see. I'm gonna open this. Yeah, we're, we're seeing, seeing it. it. Okay, good. Um all right, now this is one particular technique that I, I was trying out too, um, which is uh, you're forming a pot. Basically, you're forming the clay over over the, uh, another pot. Um, mm -hmm. And this allows you to stretch the clay over it. It's like a rolling pin. Um, and so by wrapping a cord around a stick, and different cords do different things. So if you have a cord that's made out of dogbane or or uh, milkweed it's going to be a softer um, pattern it's not going to show up as strong this is cord from uh, inner elm bark or mm -hmm. mulberry bark and it and it's a lot more you know it, it shows a lot better mm -hmm. um, i want to show you an oldie okay this is um one from um from o ohio here and you can see the cord marks on this one this one is a little. Can you enlarge that, Richard? It's not. It's not okay. enlarging. See. How about that? Does that help, or is that not? Not really. Not really. Okay. Let me let me try another one here. I think I have some other pictures here. Yeah, I've not done much of this kind of thing here before. Yeah. No problem. How about that one? Does that help in any? It's yeah, it highlights, but it doesn't get any larger for some reason. I don't know why. Yeah. Okay, so, so maybe <laughs> maybe it's better. I mean, I can show you these things, but it's better to show you the real stuff, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah okay. Maybe at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fine. Yeah. Uh, I can do that. Um let me let me do that. Okay, so what I have here is I have the stick that um, that I was using on uh, stretching that clay, and I was just rolling it like oh. this down down the side. So you you already paddle the the clay over the bottom of another pot, right? And then you use this as a roller, and you kind of roll it, and it actually stretches the clay further and further. Now, when I was doing that, I realized that was limited, very limited. And I started noticing that some of this, some of the, um, those lines, those cord marks were going all the way up the side of the pot. And I thought, there's got to be another way. And I was, uh, I was at um, uh, a museum. Well, it was kind of a place where um, artifacts are brought before the process and it had this huge, it was a huge warehouse and they had all these, the tools and pottery and everywhere. And I, and I asked if I could see some of the bone tools from the same area mm -hmm. and they showed me a, a bone tool. It looked pretty much like this, really straight and rounded. And it had mm -hmm. um, some little grooves in it about halfway down. And some of the grooves in the middle were, were really worn Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's interesting. It's almost like a spindle, you know, and I, I started thinking how, wow, you know, if this was something in a woman's hair where she could pull out mm -hmm. and she could put um, through a little piece of river cane, which is everywhere out, you know, it would have been everywhere, and then wrap the cord around river cane like this, you have a one-handed rolling pin, you know, mm -hmm. and you can roll this, roll the, the clay with your hand on the inside you know, and um, with this on the outside, you can you can stretch that clay as you're building. And so this is right. what I was, I was seeing on a number of old pots was that the the um, the the um, impressions, you know, the cord went all the way up to the rim. Sometimes they would wipe out around the neck. They'd wipe that out, and make it smooth, and then they would put in their their designs, you know, uh, along the uh, along that neck. But uh, so this this thing, we we started testing it. You know, we started really working on this. And we made some different sized ones. We did one with a, a little larger um, cane, mm -hmm. and a little thicker cord, but the exact same size as that bone bone tool. And so this is something we're we're finding, uh, you know, duplicates the process 
just you know it's exactly. and and I think what's fascinating here here's a here's an interesting connection so so you know they not only had good uh, a good understanding of the clays and how to work that but these tools um you know you you had to make the cord you had to know the materials to make the cord and right. and that in and of itself is is quite an art yeah well yeah and i mean this is something i mean making cord I mean, you think of these, some of these cultures made fishnets, you know, and I right. mean, they would be sitting around making miles of cord, you know, in the wintertime when there's not much to do and sitting around the fire and just taking more, more fiber and just twisting it and just talking. And, you know, you get to the place where you can talk and without even thinking, it's almost like people who are knitting all the time, you know, it's, you can start twisting cord and you notice you can feel when it needs pieces needed to be added in. There's just a feeling like this one side is getting a little thin. And so it's time to, you know, put work in another, yeah. piece, you know, and twist it in. And so, um, but so, so anyway, um, there's a, the other, the other thing we used, of course, too, which everybody knows is are, are pretty confident about is, is a cord covered paddle, mm -hmm. you know, and you will see that too. You'll see that on some of these old pots because you see it actually flattened, you know, you'll see a cord. It's almost like, you know, it's been tapped like this and then it's, and it's often, um, you know, at different angles. It's not all just one way all the way up. Gotcha. And so this was definitely used too. Um, but it was always, it wasn't necessarily, I really feel like a lot of the stuff wasn't used for decoration. It was used because that's the track, you know, that's the method used to construct it, you know? So, even with these ancient uh, Southwestern, uh, with the corrugated pottery, um, you know, it, 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 it was functional. When you make a, a pot out of those tiny coils like that and flatten them on, and, and it's almost like a, uh, you're layering and layering all these layers of clay because when, as soon as you flatten it, and then you add the clay to what you just flattened and you keep doing that over and over. It's almost like, like layers and layers, almost mm -hmm. like a samurai sword is made, you know, just, you know, uh, many layers of, of clay uh, mm -hmm. and it also you're working out any air bubbles and that so these kind of pots you know these kind of uh, in the southwest would have been used for cooking they they were just right you know, ideal for cooking and um, so <clears throat> that's that's that was something too I've uh, I've been looking you know you, you can't there are some um anthropologists that have been studying and they come up with really elaborate theories, you know, about how things were made. And I look at them and I just think, I don't know. It just seems like it's, you're making this more complicated than it really is. It's like, you know, it, 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 I don't know if people would sit around thinking, Oh, let's make this as hard as possible. You know? Right. Right. <laughs> let's try to think of a way that's really going to make it, you know, make it easy. Um, right. This is assured uh, from our homelands in Ontario right here. Huh. This is an old shirt from the 1500s, and there's um, you can mm -hmm. see it, it has a what they call a collar. This is the collar yeah. right here, and this little point right here they call that a castellation. And this particular type of pottery, there would only be two of these, one across the other, uh, these little castellations, and they're usually flat on top, like a little mesa top, and um, so. <laughs> But if you look on the inside, it's smooth, you know, and it's been mm -hmm. burnished inside, even with a stone. So our bone, either way, you could have burnished it. So to get that collar, to get that effect, there was a coil added to the outside here. I don't know if you can see that. I'm, um, if you can see up that close, mm -hmm. the coil was added to the outside, smoothed down. Mm-hmm. And then it was smoothed up like this. And we're, we're finding now that some of the clay that was actually added to create this thickness here is had less temper than what the, the pot was made out of. Uh. There's a reason for that because when you're doing your design work and usually on something like this, it was as simple as just a little bone all like this, just a little bone tool. You're dragging, you're dragging that that uh, bone through, you know, like that. So you have a nice straight line that way when you're pulling it. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it's if it doesn't have so much grit in it, you know, you're getting a much cleaner line, you know. So yeah, you don't have to worry about 
uh, hitting it. And I mean, the detail on this, it looks really simple. It looks mm -hmm. you know, fairly simple, but when you try this, it's, uh, it's not so simple anymore because these all end, you know, at certain spots, these little drag marks, you know, they all end at certain places. And, uh, but when you start studying them and reading them, like I do, I mean, I spend, I can spend hours with these. I just leave them out all the time because I'm constantly picking them up and looking at them again. Mm -hmm. And you'll see a place where they had started pulling the line this way. And then they went back this way and pulled it that way. You can actually see see that where they changed, you know. So it's almost like being there, you know. It's like yeah, when this pot was being made, and and that's that's pretty amazing. You know, I've heard a I heard a uh, presentation earlier in the summer. It was done by a man working with uh, some of the tribes uh, in the Wabanaki Confederacy in Maine. Of course, a lot of them had you know on the rivers were connected to the coast. Uh, you know, the Passamaquoddy actually lived on the coast. And uh, he was uh, basically, uh, you know, given a demonstration of, of walking, you know, a coastline or a river bank. And, you know, you find these these old sherds, these 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 pieces of pottery. And, uh, you know, he talked about that, you know, part of the attraction he had was that when he picked those up, it was like a connection with the people. He said, it's almost, it's almost palpable. I'm picking up something that my ancestors made. They, they held. And, and that's, that's gotta be part of your work too. I mean, you've got to feel. Is. It is, you know, and that's, that's why we've actually started cooking in these pots too, you know, um, because that even takes you further, you know, and uh -huh. we talk about, you know, language revitalization and the arts or vitalizing the arts and our food sovereignty and all these things, they all kind of come up out of the same garden as the arts. And when, you know, it doesn't mean, you know, that we're out there and we're, all we're going to do is reproductions for the rest of our right. life. Right. It's no. a good place to start, you know. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. 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 So, uh, and this is, you know, like this is an example of a Fort Ancient type pot that uh, that you can see the the the, um, the marks on the outside from from that wrapped. Um, uh, yeah, that one tool. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. Because it just it pulls it up like this. And I, I'll tell you something else that happened too. I was looking at some of the old pottery, and I noticed that up toward the neck just toward the neck that there were just lines put in there just lines and i was thinking what was what what's the deal with that until i started using it and i realized that sometimes when you're pulling this up like this it kind of gets stuck it doesn't you know it's not uh it's not rolling and so right. it gets swollen you know it gets wet the cane gets a little wet and so what you're doing you're actually dragging it and it just leaves a drag line. So it's something so simple as that. You can overlook yeah. and yeah. think that that was an intentional thing, but it, it was just part of the, the tool marks. Again, you know, it's the history mm -hmm. it's telling you what happened. That's why mm -hmm. I like those corrugated pots too, because it's like every coil is recording a, you know, a minute of someone's life. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a progression there, you know, that you, you you're, you're yeah, yeah. And that's, and, and, you know, that's the other fascinating part about this, Richard. And, and, you know, you mentioned, yeah, you're starting to cook in these pots to, you know, prepare food in these pots. And uh, so this was when pottery was made as utensils, everyday things to be used. This wasn't art as we think of art separate from everyday use. These were all practical objects. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. I was going to eh, see. Um, yeah. And of course, you know, we, we have a lot of this form here shows up in our villages a lot, which, uh, you know, it has a single castellation or they call it a prow. It has mm -hmm. it a lot like a boat prow. They are canoe people. You know, our people were canoe people. Um, so you do see those kind of sweeping lines, you know, and mm -hmm. um, one thing we've noticed, too, when you look at a lot of pottery shirts in the collections, not everybody was a pro at this. You know, I mean, 
some people <laughs> were just making pots, you know, and, and they were just, they were okay. They could make cooking pots and they yeah. you know, were able to cook food in it, but they weren't that beautiful. And then there's some that's like, that person had a gift, you know, their yeah. eye was just, yeah, amazing. right. Yeah. And you look at, you know, some of the lines, the clean lines and things and you, you know, to do that with clay, you know, that takes a real intention, you know, to try to get that sweep, you know, to get that curve just right, you know, and cause clay is, you know, it tends to be kind of, you know, yeah, we can, but uh, so anyway, those, those are kind of interesting too, when you start looking at, and also children's pottery. Um, oh yeah. One of my friends is studying uh, children's pottery up there, uh, Stephen Dorland. And, you know, that's one of the things he's been noticing and it's um, they can tell by the fingernail prints in the clay, you know, these tiny little fingernail prints and children are sitting there and they're watching their auntie or their grandmother make pottery and they want to, and the, they give them a piece of clay. And, and so the kids start working. Well, often, I mean, what you find, you don't, you find that the kids are making little monsters or little things like they're trying to make pottery, just like their, their auntie, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they're, um, they're really, they want to do what, you know, the elder people are doing. Yeah. And uh, so that's, that's something kind of fascinating too, you know, uh, with our people, you don't see curved lines, you know, in the, in the, in the pottery when it's scored in, they're always horizontal or straight or vertical, but they're all, you know, they're, or diagonal, but they're, uh -huh. and, you know, I mean, you can make a lot out of that, but I, I, I think there's a, a reason for that too. Oh, I was going to get my, one of, the, one of my cooking pots. This is one I just got through cooking with um, recently. So it's, that's why it's all black. They get pretty black after use. So, but um, you'll notice the, the designs and you will see triangles. Yeah. You'll see little notches, things like that but no curves at all. And I think about that. And I think about how when a, when a person woke up in a longhouse village and what is secure to them, you know, would be, and, and they look out the door, the palisades, you know, around the village, all these poles, you know, they're all mm -hmm. around, you know, that safety, um, the structure in the longhouse, all those poles, you know, they're holding things up. Uh, mm -hmm. That, that, that just, felt safe it made it you know it felt warm so for some people curves and you know uh, squiggles you know might have been comforting but for for our people it seemed like those parallel lines were were comfortable and you know these were matriarchal societies too you know these were societies that were grounded on women the women basically held everything you know and oh yeah the men were fortunate actually in those societies because they were either they were chosen to be hunters warriors diplomats they, none of but nobody wanted to be a diplomat but <laughs> somebody had to do it <laughs> hey. nobody wanted to be that <laughs> But it was, yeah, it's one of those things that, um, you know, when you, oh, okay, I'll, another example, you know, um, I started uh, with the, the pottery, you paddling, you know, clay over another, mm -hmm. and I started thinking about that. It's like, this, is, we got a story about this, you know, our creation story talks about, you know, the sky woman when she fell down on earth, or mm. uh, was put on the back of a turtle, because mm -hmm. there was no place for her. And, um, you know, there was a, a great sacrifice was made. You know, it's not winter time, so we can't tell the story, but we can refer to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and a, a little toad basically brought up earth, you know, from that had fallen with her. Yeah. And she took that little bit of earth and put it on the back of the turtle and started to, to dance. And with her feet started spreading that earth and spreading it all over the back of that turtle. And then the turtle began to, you know, grow, you know, as she sang and until it became the earth, you know, and, and the ridges on the back of that um, alligator snapper or that American snapper turtle yeah. the mountains and the hills. And so um, there's all those stories are, uh, are related to the arts because it's all part of every day too, you know? Right. You know, we, we, in uh, Wyandotte, we say, Rashitu Yate, that's the dance. That's a shuffle dance. It's a shuffle the, dance, okay. You know, it's where the women's feet don't leave the you know ground. They just, there's that shuffling they do. It's what's smearing. It's kind of like smearing that clay on the Right, 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 right. 
Okay. And always, always counterclockwise. You know, that's our, yeah. you know, just, just like you guys, you know, it's uh, exactly. It's yeah. Fun, you know? It's always counterclockwise because yeah. that's the way the bean vine grows, you know, mm-hmm. you know, I was down in uh, New Zealand a while back and I saw somebody growing beans out in their, out in their yard and it, Oh man, I wonder if they grow, you know, the wrong the other way, you know, down here. <laughs> so I had to, can I go see your bean vines? <laughs> so I, I went out to their garden. It's like, ah, phew, yeah, they still grow. <laughs> yeah, of. really? Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, this is this is something I think that again, um, this kind of work you've done, Richard, brings to life this incredible integration between, you know, uh, creativity, practicality, uh, and and then the way these things get woven into or a part of story, song, ceremony, all of that is, to me, that's, that's the piece that too often the people from the outside who just look at one kind of narrow lens, oh, I really like how beautiful that pot is and everything. What I like about it is you're telling a whole bunch of stories about, you know, their tools, you know, uh, how they were, how they were made, why they might explain different things that are different. And to me, that is, that is really what is, is crucial to appreciate about our ancestors. They pretty creative folks. Oh, uh, for sure. Yeah. And adaptable, you know, amazing. Yeah, and adaptable. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's constantly, you know, people are trying to figure out how things were done. And, um, but I think sometimes people do tend to look for a more complicated story, you know, than, yeah. It's like, cause, uh, you know, we're going to do something the easiest way possible still. I mean, you're, well, you're sure. About that, yeah. But you're going to want to put designs in it. And uh, even a little tool like this, you know, which is a little, um, a little bone tool, uh-huh. serrated teeth, and um, a pin going through it. To take that like that between your fingers and rolling it, you know, you, you can make a, you know, you can make lines, you know, really nice straight lines, and they're little dotted lines. It almost looks like somebody took a, a string of beads and pushed it into the clay. When you see that. Mm-hmm. So it's led people to think maybe those are beads. You know, it's like nobody made seed beads back then. <laughs> they didn't like those guys. Mm-hmm. There was a tool that was found in um, Ontario, and it looks just like this one right here. And they weren't sure uh, from what village it came from. It's at the museum, the Royal Ontario Museum. Um, but I saw that, and I thought, I know what that's used for. Because mm-hmm. there are some designs... Um, on some of the pottery where instead of dragging a bone tool to make these lines, they actually used a, a, a tool like this and they could, you know, imprint those little ah, uh-huh. lines. And this way yeah. you have yeah, yeah, yeah. control over mm-hmm. that. You know? And so, it, yeah, it makes so much sense. So it might have been, you know, that the idea came from a harpoon or it might have come from, a, you know, a, a point. You know, like something that might have been used or it might have been a point, you know, at one mm-hmm. time. And then, you know, um, you know, a grandmother just said, can I, I want this one. <laughs> she didn't say, can I? Mm-hmm. She said, I want that one <laughs> for my pottery making. You know, so uh, things, things like that. Again, I, yeah, most of the tools I'm, I'm convinced, you know, were used for multiple pur- purposes, you know, and of course, muscle shells, you know, for, for smooth mm-hmm. you know, inside the, the clay. and Yeah. Yeah, for sure, for sure. So, what? How would you say? So, this is this is, I think, one of the interesting questions. You said, you know, we're not just gonna. So, we learn these these methods of our ancestors. Try to learn these techniques, understand them. You know, come to appreciate them for, you know, for how marvelous they were. But you said that doesn't mean we're just gonna you know, imitate what they've done. So how has, how has, I'm fascinated to know how this work has affected your art now. You know, you're a a modern, you know, wine dot man, an artist. How has that affected that? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I think that's, I've never been one to hold back too much. So, I mean, in my perspective, I mean, yeah, some people, they might think I'm pretty conservative because I'm always making symmetrical things. I'm not, you know, right craziness up the side of the wall or anything like that so 
because uh, I am pretty grounded in traditional forms and that. But for me, it's like, um, you know, I, I see what the Wendat used to do with their be their quill work and their moose hair embroidery on, on black moccasins, you know, that stuff that's so tight and amazing. I think I'm going to use design like that on my pottery. You know, I'm going to get a black oh. surface and I'm going to, you know, do floral work, you know, on the pottery. So it, it's never been done before, not like that, but, you know, it might be a wind out form, you know, with the castellations or um, the, the type of pot it is. So it, again, it's, it's, um, it's just integrating. It's almost like opening a door to freedom, you know, in a way. Yeah. So well, I think I have the freedom to do that, you know, yeah, I think that, you know, I'm going to tell you, I think that's a great example of indigenous ingenuity. We take that knowledge from our old ones and we use it today to solve very contemporary design issues, you know, form issues. Oh, yeah. It's not an exact replication, but it's that indigenous ingenuity, taking something, you know, that is ancient and finding modern expressions of that. Yeah, exactly. yeah. I got to show you another pot. Um, this is one that, you know, they were doing a lot of, they're still doing a lot of sort of Southwestern uh, reproductions, you know, with uh, Anasazi type stuff. But here was my response. <laughs> so it looks like a, looks like an old, old pot, you know. Yeah. Then on the inside. I don't know if you can see here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, part, part of it for me, you know, is kind of having fun with it. Yeah. And, and making something that still looks kind of ancient has sort yeah. of a old feel to it, like something you could dig out of the ground that an archaeologist would start digging this up and go, what the? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was going to say, be careful where you leave that laying around. You're going to have, you're going to really get some archaeologists going. <laughs> yeah, so that's fun. You know, um, but it was, you know, I mean, it was fired in a traditional way. You know, it's like a lot of these pots here. They're all fired oh, yeah. in the open. And, you know, when I do traditional firing, I don't use metal. You know, I don't put any metal around them. It's just the wood, you know. Wood yeah, just the wood. Okay. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that. So when you fire the pottery do you try to do it in in the traditional kind of method that the ancestors did it as much as possible we do you know of course we use a shovel or an I sure. face mask on you know plastic face mask when i'm having to get too close to the fire um but uh yeah we uh but there's a whole um way of firing that, that's yeah. safe and a way to do it without losing pots and um i, I believe um the museum now has one of those uh the films on that and that's I cool hope people can take note on that because that is so frustrating when people work so hard you know oh uh, yeah on pieces many pieces and they they have some blow up or explode but i'll yeah. tell you right now the see there's two secrets you have to have you have to have make sure you have plenty of temper in the clay so there's okay. got to be at least 30 percent temper in the clay at least 30 percent and it's also uh, got to, it. You've got to dry it around the fire, your pots, until they're already ringing. So when you thump them, they're starting to ring like they're fired already, and they're not even fired yet. But and they're not all, even fired yet. Not okay. even fired, but they'll ring. And once they do that, you know you're pretty safe. You can you can do it. But it's uh -huh. the 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 secret is just to introduce it. You know, introduce the clay to the fire very slowly. And so they're getting to know each other. You know, there's mm -hmm. this, they're not enemies. You know, they're going to be friends here. They're going to be work together. And that's yeah. the secret. Yeah. You know, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That's really fantastic. You know, this is the time's going too fast. We never have enough time to really dive into things. But, um, you know, I, I guess my last question would, would be to you is, is sort of, uh, you know, doing this work um what would you say was was you know what was the biggest surprise you had when you you started really getting in this and you go like wow i you know i never really thought of this 
<laughs> wow. Um, wow, there's there's a number of those little things, you know, that happen. And some of them have been recent, just like the uh, the discovery that two different clays were used, you know. On the, oh, uh-huh. Uh, or the clay without much temper, you know, was put on the outside. So you yeah. have a smooth palette or a, um, a canvas, you know, to pull your lines on. Right. Things like that were kind of uh, big surprises. Um, and that's more recent, I guess. Yeah, you know, yeah. The corrugated pottery, which I, you know, what they call my work, you know, my my, my contemporary stuff's corrugated. Okay. Um, uh, you know, f for that, it's, I mean, I look at some of the ancient stuff um, and I say, they're actually basket weavers too. They make baskets. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like they're building this pot like a basket, and they. It looks it. like yeah, yeah. And I mean, they not only have that that look, but like you say, even the construction was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, so it, it, it makes you realize, you know, these people had gifts in so many ways. I mean, they had they could they knew fibers. They knew how to take yucca and make fiber. Exactly. They knew how to make a turkey blanket to keep warm in the winter, you know, with all the, just the feathers and they yeah. kept turkeys, you know, they kept turkeys. So that not yeah. that they kept, so they could pull the feathers, you know, uh, turkey is one of the few animals, you know, that you can pluck and it'll grow back another feather, you know? Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. So things like that are pretty amazing. You know, that, uh, uh, the survival of people, you know, uh, and, it, and not just survival, but happiness, you know, people were thankful. I oh, mean, when, no. when, we, when we get together in our longhouse traditions, it's all about giving thanks, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, we do, you know, we give thanks. We don't, we don't uh, petition our creator for things. We just, yeah, give right. That's all we do, you know? Yeah. It's about giving thanks. I, I think that's, that's so true. And, and, you know, uh, I had an interview with Robin Wall Kimmerer, you know, Potawatomi woman, and you may be familiar with her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, but, oh, you know, yeah. I said, you know, you look at her book and I said, you know, really, thank you, because what I took away from it was you you gave me the the three G's. My my friend and mentor, Vine Deloria, used to say, you know, our worldviews are all about power, place, and personality, who we are. And I said, you gave me, he had the three P's, you gave me the three G's. Hmm. You gave me gifts gratitude, and then following that, generosity. Uh -huh. And those seem to be really a part of who we are. You know, those three are really woven together. So, so um, you know, we're going to have to wrap this up, Richard, but I tell you what, um, I can hardly wait to where we have face-to-face -face events again, because uh, um, I'm going to try to get down there when you do one of your uh, workshops on pottery. I tell you that this is really uh inspiring to hear you talk about it and share that so well, anyway i just want to say sunlay sunlay that's why thanks so much that's going yeah. Yeah.